Welcome back to the show, everybody. We've got an exciting, interesting, you know, very, you know, very important announcement that we're going to be making near the end of the show. So everybody tune in, listen to that. That's going to be big. Episodes brought to you by ERT Radio, E-R-R-T Radio, courtesy of Ron. Go to Mixler.com and set up your account there and you get, follow us. And then you can listen to the other great lineups um, that he's got there. Dimensions of the Super by Maureen. You've got Into the Outer Realms um, on there along with ours. And so just everybody sit back. We've got Maria Wheatley live from... Uh, England. She is over there across the pond and she has graciously stayed awake. So we could, so, so I'm sure she's, um, she's been drinking the strongest of the teas to try to keep awake right now. So I'm sure, you know, it's like a double, um, I don't even, we have a double espresso. I'm sure they have coffee over there. I'm not sure if it's a double Earl Grey or how they do that. I'm, we'll have to ask her. Is that one of those things that they brew an extra strong, you know, cup of tea and is it proper? These are, these are burning questions. We will have to ask her, does she drink a proper cup of tea? Or is she a rebel and just drinks it black? So we'll we'll see there. But it, she's she you can find her information on the Avebury Experience dot co dot uk. I'm not sure if you pronounce it co or co. I'm not sure. But that you can find all the information that she has for nearly 30 years. Author, researcher. Um, she's done many tours and workshops um, covering Stonehenge, which is one of the things that we main thing we're going to be talking is her latest book. And why the crown hates it. We're going to be talking about that, find, finding that for us. So I'll see you can find her at the Esoteric College, where you can take some courses and be esoteric. Ooh, exciting. So we, we get those things, but every, enough, enough joking around. We need to get some serious questions. Like I said, is that a proper cup of tea? And we will find out right after I find the button here. Right now. <laughs> Welcome to the Three Beards Podcast. My name's Craig, along with Austin and Chris. Passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century. Let me out. All right, everybody, everybody. That's it. We're here, except for Chris. I'm not sure where he's at. So he's he's definitely got to be here for next week. That's that's the thing. Is I'm gonna if if I have to if I if I have to nail him to a chair, enforce it. You know, tie him there and make sure that he's there to you know see everybody. It's like he'll be there for next week. If I have to. Uh, this, I mean, that's up to Chris, right? Oh, yeah, it is. It is. Yep, right. yep. It yep. was, it was rhetorical. Now, they, so we got everybody. King, April, Derek's here, M.A. Allen, Horaboros here, Maria. So we got Erilyn. She's here too. So I said, you know, appreciate everybody checking in. You know, Mark's obviously here live. So he's not, he's not having to type in the chat. So, but like I said, it's or late over the long. Yeah. 
I know he's, if you look behind him, he's got some interactive scenery behind you where you'll see some flashes. Yeah. That's NEM, a twister. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, you can see, see the storm. Is it getting uh, scary? <laughs> yeah, the uh, storm is approaching the house. So if I disappear, uh, it's an electrical problem. What's up, MA? Yeah, no. You know, it's, it's fine. You know, don't and, don't play with the electricity, though. <laughs> yeah. Let's bring, let's bring on the guest of the hour here because I know it's late. and We don't want to keep her holding it so long there. Maria Wheatley, how are you? I'm very well. And, yes, I've had Earl Grey tea, and it's been absolutely delightful. So, All right. Now, uh, is it a proper cup of tea? It's a proper cup of tea. All right. <laughs> For anybody that doesn't know that, um, like I said, what is the proper you know, way to construct a pro proper cup of tea. So that way. You boil the kettle, you put the tea into the pot and then you pour in the uh, water and then you add a little bit of splash, splash of milk into a cup and then you pour the tea into the cup. That's how we do it in what's called the Wessex way. I'm in an ancient county called the Kingdom of Wessex and that's how we do it there. But how they do it in the north that's a different story. <laughs> and I know there's people that do it here, right here, but um, mo a lot of people in England don't use um, diapers for their tea. They don't use the bags. No. Come, they use yeah, the, it's it's loose loose tea in the in the things. Yeah, we don't. They don't use the little paper diapers. <laughs> little paper diapers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. No Lipton. No Lipton tea bags. You know, for for up there. That's that's kind of frowned upon if you whip out your little Earl Grey packet and just rip it open, shake the little thing, drop it in a cup. They kind of look at you funny. They use kind of like uh, it's kind of like going to Italy and snapping the pasta. <laughs> yeah, that's not gonna happen. Let's face it, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to show, like I talked about here. I want to show it up here on screen for everybody that could see it here too. So it's yeah. So here's. The Avery experience where you can go in there, um, not only go to the shop, shop right here, and you can see this is this might be what we're talking about tonight. Yeah, it is possibly. Yeah, so it, you know, take this the secret history, and uh, it, it was a little bit of a quip, but you know, it is true. You know, why does the crown hate this book? You know, you know, it's like so. And if you've got, if you like this one, as you can see. She's got a little bit of interest and knowledge when it comes to Stonehenge just, and just Stone weeper. Circles. Yeah. Just so so you, you can go there and you can purchase this one, including this one. So you definitely have. And I'm not sure. Brian, ask your question, sir. Yes. Oh, well, I always it's ask, early. can somebody get an autographed copy of your books? Is that possible? Absolutely. I mean, if you go to my website, that's the best way to do it. And I can, you know, personally sign and I can sign a copy. So, uh, so yeah, you know, just go to uh, my website, theavbexperience.co.uk. We say co.uk in the UK okay. uh, uh, or esotericcollege.com or even my landing platform, which is mariawebe.uk. So I'm a Brit, mariawebe.uk. There you go. All right. So there, there you go. So we have, all right. So now this, let's start with like the big burn. When Mark said it, that's, that's what stuck in my head. And I really, I really wanted to keep with that one. So what, what is it about, you know, actually happened? I mean, so you, you basically got your books pulled from the shop. That's right. I mean, I've been writing for English Heritage Stonehenge Shop for, oh my gosh, about sort of 10 years or so now. And I bring out the secret history of Stonehenge and within literally about a day of them reviewing the book, all of my products were banned from Stonehenge Shop. And uh, I think it's because, you know, you're, when you're getting close to the truth, as I'm sure you guys are fully aware, when you get close to the truth, that's when doors start to close in certain establishments. And that's what happened to me therein. Yeah, so. that, yeah, no, and that, that was kind of the thing, too. It's just, do you think it was it had something to do, because it seems like any time you challenge the narrative with Egyptology, because that is such a big tourist you know the tourist thing with england anyway we just they've we'll say they've borrowed a few artifacts you know at, at there in the natural history museums so 
and anytime you challenge the narrative, because uh, oh, his name's failing me. So, is it Zawahiri? Yes, I know who you're talking about the the uh, the Egyptologist, the one yeah. where I don't care how many times specials come on. I'm like, if I have to watch another hour special where they take you through digging, you know, unearthing some unlost tomb, and all it is is a pile of dusty bones and not something exciting, I'm gonna I'm gonna lose my mind. I'm like, I can't get that hour and a half back. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I think that happens over here as well, because, you know, it's only a few archaeologists that are actually, you know, allowed to dig in certain sites and they have to, you know, go through UNESCO and they have their own narrative. So, for example, most people that recently that have excavated Stonehenge is Mike Parker Pearson of UCL uh, London. That's University of College London. And he will say one narrative, and that narrative is the same as if, if it's in Egypt. It's all about the dead. It's about the people that have mm -hmm. passed. And that's the narrative. And if we change the narrative, that's when uh, doors get closed. Do you, do you want to call uh, King Chucky and uh, change this? <laughs> uh, well, I'd like to think so. I'd like to think if I challenge, I've actually written the last time, you see at Stonehenge, it was said that uh, in 1624, that an architect to James I called Inigo Jones, they apparently took a stone from Stonehenge, the second altar stone, and took it to St. James's Palace in London. They stole a stone in, in effect. And the last person to have looked and gone through this trail of where has it gone was a, an archaeologist called William Cunnington. And William Cunnington wrote to St. James's Palace in London. And just for the American audience, prior to Buckingham Palace being built, St. James's Palace was the royal residence long, long before Buckingham Palace. So William Cunnington wrote to uh, St. James's Palace and said, where's this altar stone, the second one, can we have it back? And the royal door was closed. And the only person that has written to St. James's Palace since 1930 is me, asking for it back. I haven't yet had a reply. Will I, will I have a reply? I don't know. I await with interest. So now nobody, has anybody seen that stone recently? No, but it was completely documented in 1624. James I was the King of England. He was uh, James VI of Scotland. He incidentally whipped up the uh, witch frenzy that eventually went to Salem in America, for, for example. So he was there. He was the first person to dig alongside the Duke of Buckingham. And uh, Indigo Jones, like I mentioned, they were the first to dig at the center of Stonehenge. And that's where they claim to have found the second altar stone, which English heritage deny ever existed. But it's been documented in ancient manuscripts. And then they tell you where they took it. It got carted away, meaning carted on horse and carriage, carted away to St. James's Palace. So we know that that's where the trail ends. Yeah, because okay. I'm wondering if like that would that was like a key. It's almost like the Rosetta Stone. Yeah, what's thing. like it would just yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing about Stonehenge is, you see, we all think we know Stonehenge because we are we are fed an image of it by English heritage, and it goes back to 1724 with William Stukeley, for example, and they tell us this is what Stonehenge looks like. But if we really start to look at the earlier documentation away from William Stukeley, away from 1724, then we start to see a slightly different Stonehenge with more stone settings and with another altar stone, for example, and a brilliant white chalk bank that surrounded it. Today, we can see Stonehenge from the road, from the A303. But let's go back to the time when the antiquarians were there. There was a huge chalk bank, 10 foot high, surrounding Stonehenge. It was a very secretive place. That got eroded and it got plowed away. So now we see Stonehenge as being open, but it wasn't like that originally. It was enclosed. It was secretive. Now, do you, 
kind of those ones. I mean, I don't know the validity of this. I, I was, when I was reading about it, somebody speculated too, that there might've been, I don't, I don't want to really want to say marker stones, but there might've been orientation stones along those mounds. Oh too. yes. I mean, everything around the, the Stonehenge of Virons has alignments and it has uh, star alignments, uh, sun alignments, and especially moon alignments, uh, especially Stonehenge is more orientated to the moon. And if you bring the barrows around Stonehenge into that, it's quite fantastic because surrounding Stonehenge was 1000 mounds. It was the largest uh, burial ground in Europe. But if we say, how many physical stars can you see with the naked eye? It's around 800 to 1,000. So some people speculate that it was a, like a planisphere of stars that surrounded Stonehenge, which has been mooted since the 19th century. Yeah, it's, it's, I think I'm trying to remember the last time when we had you on, if I um, talked about the standing um, stones, because that's one of the things, too, along that there is a huge... You know, Trilithons. yeah, just there, they are everywhere. I mean, they've been really popular, especially here, here in the U S stuff with the uh, Diana Gabaldon, you know, Outlander series, you know, that's one of those things that's really got, you know, a lot of people that normally wouldn't have paid attention, wouldn't have cared. Now, you know, they're walking up, they could take the trip so they can go put their hand on the stone and you know, trying to hopefully they can magically transport and get their Jamie, but it's not, you know, it's not happening, but it's just one of the, have, all jokes aside, if they do, you, do you find that there that there's some connection to like a central place like Stonehenge, or is this one like these are many versions of that? Like as people have moved tribal wise, they kind of tried to build their own version wherever they were at. When it comes to the very large stone settings and stone circles in the British Isles, the largest are in the Neolithic. They're the oldest, so they date back about five and a half thousand years. The smaller the stone circles get, they become late Bronze Age, for, for example. But one thing about Stonehenge, it is completely unique to any other stone circle, and it has the trilithons that surround the center of the monument. So Stonehenge, in effect, has 30 lintelled stones creating a beautiful stone circle that was highly polished and very silver and pinkish looking. It was a very colorful place inside of which you had five trilithons. I think there was an extra trilithon there making six like Indigo Jones drew out and I've got tattooed on my arm, <laughs> Indico Jones's version of Stonehenge has an extra trilithon. But here's the thing. You've got to remember that before English Heritage, UNESCO were formed, who runs Stonehenge? And it was the Ministry of Works, a government department that ran Stonehenge. And there was one stone set in, it was called Trilithon 51 and 52 for the geeks out there they like numbers on stones and what what was found was that the creator of stonehenge who was a custodian a tour guide he was called tom gory he he basically was a custodian from about 1930 to about 1950 he knew stonehenge like the back of his hand and he claimed that in 1950s for example that's uh, indigo jones version of the six trilithons of talk about the missing trilithon in a moment at trilithon 51 he claimed that tom gory you could put your arm right the way down into the inside of this standing stone he's our witness number one and then he said a most curious thing he said that no matter what the weather was whether it was a drought whether it was a really hot day whether it was a rainy day that hole that you could put your arm down about two feet inside of a massive trilithon would fill with with water and people started to say that water was healing it could cure eczema it could cure the falling sickness which back then was called epilepsy and so people started to gather there and when they gathered ministry of works the government department didn't like this 
And even though it was renowned for healing, they filled that hole up with concrete and plastic. So no one could experience those healing energies again. And Tom Gorey was aghast about that. He said, this is wrong. We shouldn't be doing this. So I think Stonehenge, to some regard, has, can be, has been completely defaced. It's it's interesting. I I, I was there. Um, unfortunately, when I went to my trip to Bath and Stonehenge, it was thick as pea soup. The fog. <laughs> oh, it but, often but, is. But to my my actually my benefit because I went right over those ropes and I walked through it, um, and didn't get caught doing that. So um, oh, wow. Yeah, I okay. mean, I had a. It, it, there's always been a desire to physically put your hand on something, but I noticed something that's um, very interesting about Stonehenge, and I do believe you are correct. There are missing stones that are that are associated with it, not just the ones they stole. Um, Absolutely. And, and I, my theory is that um, it was designed uh, for acoustic semi, uh, um, you know, s- celebrations and maybe even um you know transportation um the way that the the followers would go in there and the fact that it's in the bowl and it would the sound would bounce off one sound frequency vibration does aid to healing um to the winds blowing through there now even will aid to healing because they create sounds through there but there's a theory about using sound frequency and vibration, not only to lift these heavy monolithic stones like they did in, in Egypt, but also as a transporter or a portal opener. So that's one of my theories there. I, you know, can't prove it because if they, if they don't want your book up there, they're not going to want me in there. Well, uh, uh, Maria covers Jeffrey of Monmouth quite a few times in his, um, descriptions of the use of levitation well yeah sound frequency and vibration can be used to levitate tons Mm -hmm. like huge monolithic stones Mm -hmm. um but it's also when you put all this together there is an energy that's created and it could trigger off just on the tones the various tones and you can do this with vocals Mm -hmm. and i I also think as well you know when uh pythagoras discovered the music of the spheres that's how the planets in their orbits create mathematical musical sound ratios that's what pythagoras discovered and then kepler came along and said the music of the spheres and he expanded the theory a little bit pythagoras was said in legend he could hear the music of the spheres and so that's is how the the planets move. And Kepler said the soul could hear it. What I discovered at Stonehenge is the concentric stone settings that you have at Stonehenge, they create those musical harmonics, those sounds and those frequencies. So, for example, if you've got the lintel stone circle, which has the famous stones on top, and then the blue stone circle, it creates a gap. That interval, that gap is called the major third in music and its mathematical ratio is five over four. Now that increases your consciousness. That's why in Gothic cathedrals across Europe, in churches, everybody sung to the major third. It increases your consciousness and your emotions. Now, that's yep. not just the only uh, sound frequency at Stonehenge that I discovered. So, yes, you're on the right track. All of these different places within Stonehenge stand in here, stand in there. They allow different aspects of our consciousness to rise to the fore. Yeah, it's, it's incredible what sound and frequency and vibration do for you. Um, there's all this talk now about um, the mud floods and these worlds that are, that were around higher tech than we had and how churches are used to actually retune your body's your frequency. Um, and if you take into consideration the Druids who are, you know, this is where this is the original, you know, bad boys and girls of this type of, of theories and, and actions. I mean, the things that, that would be done would would be mind blowing today. This is yeah. silly theory. 
Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I think, you know, <laughs> the, yeah, uh, the, 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 the Druids, for example, I mean, they were much later than Stonehenge because it was the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, but the technology went backwards. So the more forward you go in the British Isles in a timeline of what was created, it actually is backward technology. So the further back we go, Yep. The larger the stones were moved. So, for example, in the Neolithic, the largest stones were moved. In the Bronze Age, the smaller stones were moved. It was a backward technology. And the further back we go, and especially if we push the timeline back with Stonehenge to 10,000 BC to, you know, sites in Turkey, for example, oh, that's the timeline. Quebec, Quebec, we Quebec, should be looking. Huh? Exactly. That's the yeah, timeline yeah. we should be looking at. In fact, with Silbury Hill, and I know Mark lives near... Uh, quite close to a massive mound that's very similar to Silbury, which I'm sure he will touch upon uh, in a moment. Uh, when we go back to look at the artifacts at the base of that mound, they go back to 12,000 BC. That was an independent researcher got there. That's the same timeline as Turkey. But we say over here, oh, everything's 2,500 BC. Oh, let's name the pyramids, well, 2,500 BC. Yep. And it goes on and on like a mantra that has gotten out of control. This is what I've been saying for a while. I challenge, you know, I always challenge Craig. <laughs> Craig probably hates me for it, but it's, he's more, you know, he's always like, well, I read it in this and NASA this. And I'm like, if you believe the science and if you believe the history books and the fossil record, you have no idea what you're talking about. You have to go beyond this. I mean, there is a Stonehenge at the bottom, I believe, of Lake Michigan. Yes. They Very discovered perfect. it in Lake Michigan. Yeah. So this is a culture that has been here long before anybody else was here. Um, and they knew something. This is one of the reasons why they led to the portal theory, because there are other areas, there's certain symbols that are found in multiple cultures. And the, the folklore and stories is things appear here. This is where people appear and disappear. And if you can use sound frequency and vibration to, you know, create a portal at the right spot, it just could be a window. You know? Exactly. And I think it's no mistake. And I've said this for, you know, decades. It's no mistake that Stonehenge is surrounded by around 16 military establishments. And you have Nevada in Nevada area 51. Uh, just beyond Stonehenge, you have no go military owned land that no civilian can go on equating to Area 51. So, I mean, the, the most sites in the British Isles on the Salisbury Plain, that's Area 51, equivalent to, to you guys, no-go area. You've got over 2,000 sites alone that are in a no-go area. And what's going on there? I'd like to be allowed to go in there. Can I? No, I can't. I'm a civilian. Good luck. You get, you get transported back out. Yep. And what's interesting is, in relationship to these mounds, Maria, mm. how much we'll call it paranormal or or activity, and that paranormal includes ghosts, residual hauntings, UFOs, strange creatures, and so on. Look at all these areas, and look what happens on the outskirts of it. You're not that far from Bath, if if I'm correct, from where, where Stonehenge is, and there is Roman soldiers that appear. You can hear them, and they disappear going down the street. Everybody knows about it, but I guess after a while, it's, ah, it's just, you know, the bloody Roman soldiers go on, you know, <laughs> it's tea time. Let's move to the pub. But I mean, like the correlation between these, these sacred locations or these spots is huge. And of course the government doesn't want you to, you know, we can't let Maria come out. We have to control the narrative. Nope. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, Bath was uh, an ancient Celtic name called Carbaden. It's the city of Bath, uh, of Baden. And they are, you know, very special places where you have a certain type of geology. You're on, you know, solid chalk bedrock. The stones at Stonehenge didn't go into the earth. They went, went into solid chalk bedrock socket holes. And that makes it very, very uh 
magnetic to a to a certain uh, regard. So yes, and that 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 chalk bedrock spreads right across Bath, and it creates a kind of very unusual mixture. And you put stones into that, and you you have a a good formula. And, and, yeah. and Bath is in a uh, another volcano. Yeah, but Bath is wonderful. I mean, it's absolutely a gorgeous. It's a, a gorgeous. Uh, and the the architect of Bath was called uh, John Wood, and he went to Stonehenge, and he got so inspired by Stonehenge. The Crescent. Did you go to the Crescent, which is a really famous yeah, yeah. horseshoe shape? That's based on the trilithons of Stonehenge. He got oh, so okay. inspired by the place. That's what he designed uh, Bath on. Yeah, it's the the exclusive neighborhood on top of the hill. <laughs> very exclusive. Yes. I mean, you know, take Salisbury Hill. It really now, now go back to the question that Craig was asking. I was kind of thinking, what is the significance of the stone that they removed? Because it clearly now, if you hear what all, all this, it lays credibility to like what's on that stone. What what petroglyph? What it you know material? What is it? Yeah, I mean absolutely. I mean when we go back, you know, to uh, the early written records of what was uh, occurring at Stonehenge, it is very uh, hit and miss. It really is. You have to go through uh, through different manuscripts. But that type of stone that was uh, taken was a form of sandstone that was imported to Stonehenge from about 150 miles away uh, in a remote part of Wales. So they were selecting stones that were three times more magnetic than any other stone in the British Isles to take to Stonehenge alone. And they would place them on particular earth energy patterns and, and lay crossings and things like that. And it's a bit like earth acupuncture. They would literally be kind of put into a particular area. And that's what gives them their strength. And that's what gives them uh, their power. So it's not just one thing. And beneath Stonehenge is a massive, massive aquifer, like you get beneath Avebury, like you get beneath Egypt, for example. And so all of this adds to a kind of cocktail, uh, if you will, of energy that releases itself through the stones. And that I think that's the power of Stonehenge. It's where it is. The ancients were looking for particular energy patterns because an aquifer releases a huge circular energy pattern of like a spiral that water diviners have known since 1899. Yeah, there's you know you you met you hit the nail on the head with with Egypt and 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 what it's what's going on there. Everybody thinks oh it's where they buried the pharaohs. Nothing was buried there. <laughs> there's no evidence to anything being buried there, any one being buried there. But there is evidence of acoustics and and different frequencies and channels and what look like. Um, at that one part of the king's chamber at the top, there was a small room, and they don't know what was in there, but if you measured it and you compared it to something called the Ark of the Covenant in its measurements, it would fit right in there. I know there's something very special about being in the king's chamber alone, the queen's chamber, and I've been into the subterranean chamber uh, as well, but beneath the, the Great Pyramid. And uh, there is something that kind of uh, is very similar in terms to places like Stonehenge. They have the same kind of earth energies. They have the same kind of uh, feeling. And what I always think is very surprising and intriguing about ancient Egypt is not far from Saqqara. You have the Serapium with those massive uh, 12 foot long coffins that each weigh 100 tons. And they have those lids on top. Of them, and what we told by Egyptologists, they were for the apis bulls to, to go into, and yeah. that's obviously ridiculous. And you have uh, researchers like Brian Forster; they come out with an alternative narrative. And I think these oh, mysteries Brian. keep us all going into what mm -hmm. was going on. And when I take people on tour to Egypt, we always uh, have you know private access to these places, and they are incredible. Well, that's, that's the thing about those things. It's just how did they get a high, high polish on granite? 
yeah. using, you know, using basic, you know, copper and bronze tools. Absolutely. Not, and, and the lines are dead straight. They're laser-like yeah. uh, in Egypt. It's like one of the things, like, you know, if you watch History Channel, it's instantly, it's because it's aliens. And it's like, <laughs> no. I'm no. like, we find Gobekli Tepe, these ones, we have seen these things. It's, there There was lost knowledge that hu humanity possessed. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the biggest ones. We're not the first civilization to roam this thing. There's yeah. been many before us. And the problem is, it's like most things happen is like even now, you know, with the threat of World War Three happening, if nukes start popping off, most of the stuff that we're talking about right now will be lost to the dustbin of history. People will, they won't know how to make computers, how to make phones. They won't know how to do all this stuff. We will instantly, within the first, a couple of months, will be knocked back into basically the boat, you know, Stone age. bow and arrow stone age yeah. type thing. And the only people that will survive in the beginning is going to be the people that know how to make medicines, how to make this. Up. These are going to be the ones that survive. But as those people die off, you'll get back to the same point where then it relapses again. You're going to have somebody thousands of years now, they're going to find the Washington monument and they're going to be, look at this massive monolith. You know, who is this great civilization that built this, this structure. And all it was, was it was a civilization before it's like, we, yeah. we have down here. I don't know if you, I'm sure you've heard of the coral castle. Yeah, absolutely. Of and that's, that's one of the things like Gobekli Tepe, there's a really good chance that what that man discussed, you know, he, figured out how to do was probably the same techniques that a lot of these civilizations prior were using to lift these things because they've, they've shown there's a, there's a way to do it, but there's no proof that these civilizations were building these massive, you know, levers and stuff and these massive objects to lift these things into place. There's no proof of that. What there is proof of is that they have oriented these giant stones that have been roughly hewn from their location, like you said, and brought to this, brought to the spot because of their properties who would know that it would be the maria wheatley who survived these cataclysmic events that right. knew if we use this in this orientation this is going to help do this thing and that's what they've sought to do to try to revert absolutely i mean and also the stones at stonehenge were highly polished you know we're talking yeah. about you know places like in egypt like granite being polished they really were and the color contrast was quite striking as well so the outer lintel stone circle was a silvery pink color now we know and then you would walk inside of the stone circle and you come across the blue stones and they would be very dark colored flexed with white and that would have looked stunning and then the altar stones they would have been green and flexed in garnet you're talking Talking about a very highly colorful place and what i also uh discovered cool would that be to see? It, it would have been amazing oh, now to see it's surrounded by a six foot wall of white chalk bank that's how archaeologists know it stood inside of that like i said a secretive place but here's the thing uh archaeologists have noticed at other henges that they were carved and sculptured in concentric stone circle patterns, chevron patterns, and spiral patterns. And what I have always noticed around these ancient sites, like Stonehenge, and even in Egypt, actually, you have ochre, and these are pigment, painted pigments. You can have yellow ochre, red ochre. Uh -oh. Oh. brown ochre and i think the the, the sculptured carvings they did on the henge bank were probably colored as well and allowing us to oh. see a very colorful place and that is not beyond the bounds of possibility so i see stonehenge as being a very colorful place with all of these symbols on a white chalk bank that is really a canvas uh for artwork it's, oh it's, yeah no but Alan said, yeah, the Rosetta Stone was a massive discovery. But no, it's kind of like the Egypt. I was Maria, while we were talking a little bit of Egyptology, I'm I'm of the believer that the ancient Egyptians found the pyramids and the Sphinx. I do not they because in any civilization, you don't digress. You know, it's like right now, as we're as our civilization, we're not making steam engines anymore. We're not making horse-drawn buggies. 
you know, like we, we are used to, or everything's progressing. We have electric, everything is steadily getting here. If you look at Egyptology, what the Egyptologists tell us is that, no, they did these things. The pyramids, the little step pyramids in front, those ones were built after the Great Pyramid. So they suddenly just stopped caring about our, you know, architecture. They just suddenly just like, eh, we've already done the big one. Eh, they just, the, te the things are getting worse. So I think what they found, they tried to recreate and they couldn't do it. Mm. It's like future generations will yeah. only try to uh, imitate Maria's book. It, That's right. <laughs> it just can't get any better. It won't work. But I, but I think you're right. That happened over here as well. You have the massive stone settings of the Neolithic, like you're saying the Great Pyramids, you know, perfection. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and tonnage, and then later the smaller stone settings. They couldn't re replicate the earlier civilization that put those stones in. And we know that they're divided by hundreds, if not thousands, of, of years anyway. So if you see, you know, a stone setting like Avebury or Stonehenge, you have the larger ones go in first and then the other ones add to it. So yes, I agree with that. And also you get, you know, uh, other researchers like Brian Forrester, they say the cartouches that were put on to certain uh, monuments in ancient Egypt, they were so much later, like Ramesses. Well, a bit like me saying, mm -hmm. I go to Egypt, Maria Wheatley was here 1974 right. or something. You know, they did that afterwards. And so it was a blank canvas. Then the cartouches, then the hieroglyphs came on it. And I'm in agreement with that. I think yep. it's far, far older. And you're talking Is about it? civilizations throughout. First of all, if you look, it's, it's come up before. There is a... a a structure, two structures in the Grand Canyon that look very much like the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid. Um, the great, the scene right there with the Sphinx in the front and the pyramid, Great Pyramid in the back. But you're talking about cultures that were were mouth to ear, um, and they didn't they didn't you know write this down. You had to remember the task. So whoever built these probably was mouth to ear. They built them and they didn't even bother putting down like the instructions, like, you know, garbage goes out every Wednesday, you know, and uh, tip the paper boy or, or whatever. Um, and then you're right. You know, they come in and like, what is this? So they make they make their own use their imagination to say, this is what this is. This is the gods that that are here. You know, we see a lion with a head on it. They must be a god. It's craziness. Don't believe yeah. what they tell you in school, kids. <laughs> well, that's why I said, because I'm just showing a picture like for people that don't realize. You can see the three there in front. Those were not, those are in nowhere near no. the the skill that was the ones prior. And so this is something that, that it's this, this right here in itself is a picture should be proof that whoever built the, the Great Pyramids was not the same civilization that built these three in the front. No. These are completely different. Thanks. And I, that's why I said, I think the ancient Egyptians came across these and they tried their best to recreate it. And there's reports throughout history that what you're seeing there with the great pyramids, they did, they didn't look like that. They were covered in stone and they had the dome, mm -hmm. the, the top portion was covered and in, in, in polished, you know, quartz and, and metals. And they just were like, where the hell did this come from? Well, you can see it just like here. You can see the difference on the top. Yeah, and, and it's – I don't like the Egyptian knowledgeist that runs – you know, he's on every one of the shows. I forgot his name, but like you were saying. Hawass. Hawass? Yeah. It, it's, it's like know, it's Zahiri. Is, I don't want to say his last name. But yeah, it's just – like, you know, I know everything. And he make, tries yeah, to make everything exciting even when they say, well, you know, that says made in China. Yes, it would say made in China because, it, you know, you know, he just doesn't. It's Egypt. We're the greatest. And that's it. And I, I guess that's part of doing your job. But mm. nothing like if if you do something contrary to what, you know, goes on with the antiquity department, you could probably get killed in, in Egypt just talking about it. You know, oh, absolutely. And Hawass, he is the kind of main curator uh, of Egypt. So everything goes through him. You right. know, so you, you could have any find 
and it would go through him. Yeah, a bit like over here, if you have new finds in Avebury, it goes through two archaeologists. If it goes through Stonehenge, it goes through their their archaeologists. But if they were, they were, you know, finished off in this brilliant white limestone, uh, the, the pyramids. Yes. And some people say a gold cap to, to the top. But uh, like I was saying earlier, with places like Stonehenge and Avebury over here, they were literally sculptured out of the solid chalk bedrock. You know, and you're having to say, OK, you've got uh, uh, Avebury, 1,088 feet of henge in diameter. Mm -hmm. And at Stonehenge, about the whole henge, not the actual stone circle, is about 880 feet. And they tell us that was prized out of the solid chalk bedrock using antlers. You know, and when you look at how that that chalk was smoothed off, that it is very difficult to prize out with these antler picks and this low technology. And recently they've analyzed the antler picks that apparently did all of this and they weren't. They were highly polished. They were shamanic. They weren't used to prize out chalk. So we have to then ask ourselves what sort of technology was used to make those henge banks. Yeah, it was uh, as we were just talking kind of the Egyptian thing too. Have you, you know, the same way like the recreations, you know, weren't the same? Yeah, you yourself, you can tell the difference, can't you? Just when you go there, just the feel and everything that's that they're they're off, that they're just basically appearance only. Yes, I mean, I I do think you know with uh, with ancient Egypt uh, that even in places like the uh, Serapeum, we're only seeing half of what is there, and apparently some uh, researchers say all of those gigantic coffins or whatever they are weighing a hundred tons that had later hieroglyphs put on them, they go on for mile after mile after mile, which has been boarded off in ancient Egypt. Many people moot so i think you know when we look to these places we're only seeing what sometimes we're allowed to see for example some people say when you go to the sphinx in ancient egypt the stelae in front of the sphinx has two sphinxes either side like that and a lot of people say where's the second sphinx was there a second sphinx like the altar stone yeah, like like the altar so because there there were there was two of them and uh, our our uh, guide our Egyptian guide to Stonehenge that's uh, the the Serapium. I mean, look how laser like the technology was used to to carve that out. I mean, and bear yeah. in mind the age of this and it's uh, suffered from you know uh, wear and tear as it were. They're absolutely uh, perfect. Uh, that yeah, they, I mean they're oh. flush. I mean they're not. Like I said, even with wear, you would have, yeah, you'd have uneven spots. I mean, this is level corners. And it's like, tell me how you did that with a chisel. Uh, exactly. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you cut, if you cut the top off and, and you have a, a top piece and a bottom piece and you were to go back and forth friction wise with a whole bunch of people <laughs> or whatever, that would actually act as a, as a, as a sander, but it still doesn't explain how the hell you cut out the middle. <laughs> How did you cut out that metal? How did you make that right angle? How did you, you know, it's just. Well, even just even sanding it down, it's like, how did you keep the straight edge? Yeah. Oh, yeah I, absolutely. And the, the smoothness. And, and if we can't, you know, address these and we look at that to say that this is ancient technology, sophisticated technology that was used throughout the ancient world. You know, not in just in one place, but throughout the ancient world, which, you know, you have to then ask the question, you know, where was this uh, technology originated from and uh, and who was using it and why? And when we look at this, it is perfection. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's you. This would be something that, you know, you would just even modern technology It's like the, the modern people that carve out stuff. They would have a hard time doing that yeah. even now, you know, to get it to this perfection. Because you'd still have somebody, they'd make a mistake, like with a water jet, you know, there would be something that would have been uneven. But for this thing to be perfectly, it's like Brian said, regardless of the explanations, how do you explain the perfect carve out mm. in the center? And, and, and if you were, how do you chisel a perfect 90, you know, corner? How do you, <laughs> Go, get, how do you, how do you get that angle so it's smooth without nothing being on, on the, you, you know, the, on the top between the, the flat portion and, and the angled portion? 
You can't do that. And the you underground. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the biggest thing is like it would have to have like even modern. They don't even know how to like to use like modern crane system, how they would have even gotten it into that position. Yeah. yeah. And they came from 180 miles away in Aswan. So they were transported all of that way, uh, 100 tons each to where they are not far from Saqqara. I mean, that alone, transporting that is a feat uh, in itself. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, Jaron says you do it with slaves. There's no way. There's no way you move 100 ton object in the position that it would have to go to get down to where this location is. So the only thing that we can guess, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong on this one, but I think the current the current theory is that it was carved in place and not not um not brought in because they're like how how was this even possible that they're thinking that this object was brought you know was here and they court they've they did all the carving in place i i would beg to differ on that i don't know for a fact but they already know what what, what stone it is and where it comes from and where it's related to in the area yeah they know it has to come from a certain point but it's 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 like people don't want don't want to think like well maybe they're Maybe there are aliens. Which culture did this? What people, what entities, what beings were here involved in it? Because it's clear that some strange star people have been mentioned in multiple cultures coming here and introducing even the, the, the legend of Atlantis, which there are several, you know, there's several different tweaks of it, um, allude to them not being of this earth and allude to them from being elsewhere. Mm. So, yeah, the, the, I mean, the granite for there came about 180 miles away. I mean, it's absolutely uh, astonishing, you know, the the feet of that alone. And and this is the thing about the uh, the ancient world. You know, we we look back and we're looking to try and solve how these ancient mysteries were in occurrence. And that's where, you know, a lot of researchers come in and find out fact after fact that the archaeologists are in uh, ignorance of, like Hoas, yep. you were talking. He will do one narrative and one narrative alone. You know, I could just yep. picture, the, the, you know, the Egyptian union foreman with a cigar in his mouth and the headpiece on i'm not moving that right now <laughs> you know <laughs> every week, i don't got enough guys for this one you know <laughs> just, just think about that how do you motivate enough people hmm. not only that where are you getting enough wood to roll it on because that would be only that would be the one of the other logic pieces is you that's that's what they said oh they put logs in front of logs but that is so heavy, it would crush every log they put underneath it. They tried to move a move, uh, blue stone in about sort of 1970s with Professor Richard Atkinson because they came from 170 miles away in Wales to go to Stonehenge. So he got a lot of, you know, public school boys and he said, we're going to heave and hoe them using rollers and, uh, you know, pieces of leather and rope and they couldn't move it that far. They actually couldn't. They did this big experimental uh, archaeology and it couldn't be moved. But then when you look to some places in uh, the Outer Hebrides of Scotland, Kalanish, there's no trees and you've got massive stone circles. So you, you, you can rule out that roller method there. Yeah. Right. I know they've done the, like the Easter Island. They did that one. They figured out that they think that they walked them. That's yes, and that is that walk. is shown actually yep. all, by by some cultures that they they did uh, walk them along, and you've got the uh, Madagascar culture, which a lot of the archaeologists in Britain look to because they do kind of move stone, very large stones along ac across long distances, but it takes a lot a lot of people and a lot of effort. Yeah, and you're not walking like that sarcophagus, you know. That's that's the thing. It's just it's, you know, even if you did, you wouldn't have that l almost like you said laser cut looking perfection, you know, where it's polished because you'd have it all marred up from. Yeah, if everybody wants, to, you can go on YouTube and watch it. They they actually did it and they they took they took a really the slab and they when they got it they actually got the motion and then they could actually sit and just do this little walk. And it was actually pretty cool that they figured out this is how they positioned those. And I'm like, I'm going, that's pretty ingenious. And that. That's always been proof for me. It's just like, 
just because we don't understand it doesn't mean alien. Doesn't mean, you know, given knowledge from the thing. It's like, there's a good chance that most of this was a prior civilization that had this, they had this knowledge. We just don't know how they did it. It's like the yeah. lead glass in the yeah. churches. We yeah. don't know how to recreate that. We know yeah. what they did. We just don't know how to do their process. And it's right. the encodement into stone circles. So, you know, if we just go back to Stonehenge, the blue stone circle is 79 feet point 20 inches. That's quite precise. And if you change the feet to miles and multiply it by 100, you have 7,920 feet. That's the diameter of the earth. So you have to say, how did the ancient peoples know the diameter of the earth? For, for instance. So, I mean, all of these different things add to a very wise, sophisticated culture that created these ancient sites worldwide. Right. And then if you if you consider the fact where they're located and the significance celestially, whatever did this, whatever culture was responsible for it, had the ability to view this planet off the planet. They were not on the planet. They had the ability to get that ultimate bird's eye view. I don't want to be the guy from ancient aliens, but sounds like <laughs> aliens. Well, you know, I think I think the ancient people were very good navigators. I think they traded a lot. I think they were uh, very good at interacting uh, with with each other as well. And I think, you know, we we kind of look at humanity and say that they're not that intelligent. When I think the further back you go, the probably more intelligent the people were, whether it's from Atlantis, lost civilizations. I think ancient aliens may play a part, but I think ancient civilizations could too yeah i mean i, I forgot what uh, it was one of those history discovery but someone uh replicated they figured out a way to using the sun and and some other stuff and they basically were able to melt stone with it like a laser would do um they got something Petrify. so hot that it would just liquefy the stone so if you have that technology I guess that's, you know, why carve it when you can just go, okay, put the stuff around it, we'll liquefy it, and it'll just melt down perfectly, and it'll be even. You know, as far as the polishing is concerned, again, I mean, considering that you have a ton of sand around there, it's sand blasting. But did it look like that when they first cut it? Or was that because sand's blowing through everything and it's just getting caught in it? You know what I'm saying? When you know it's kind of like sea glass. If you let wind, air, and and sand come together, you're going to create a smoother substance. Hmm. Yeah, like by like polishing uh, stone uh, in in that regard. And and what they were doing to to polish the stones at Stonehenge, they were slightly chipping off because you found tonnage, of very very small uh, chippings. And then they would kind of make it very, very smooth. I remember showing Brian Forrester around Avebury and showing him highly polished sarsen stone that is so, so smooth to the touch. It is really, really smooth. You can put your hand over it and it's smooth. I mean, what you're seeing at stone circles across the British Isles and Brittany and further besides, they look very rough. They look very grey. That's, that's you know, thousands of years of British weather for one and, and erosion. So they were very... And also, you know, in the 19th century at Stonehenge, sadly so, you could buy a hammer from the local town called Amesbury and then take it to Stonehenge and start chipping off bits of chunks to take home. That's why the, the stones are all a very odd shape because they all believed a uh, hundred or so years ago, you take a piece of that stone home and it's healing. And that's why they were selling hammers there and people were going crazy. They've estimated tonnage has been taken through its healing properties at Stonehenge. Wow. That's crazy. Well, so crazy. Everybody's, everybody's busting me right now. I, I, I put the soda underneath the table so that way I can pop it open without that loud hiss. And now everybody's busting, giving me a hard time for, you know, keep your hands above the table. I just, I just, I just, yeah. 
I, I can't uh, help but, but think of, you know, the character of Tiny Tim or, or, you know, some little, you know, get your free Avery Stones, mate. Let's go. You know, it's just screaming. <laughs> That's a very good English accent. I like that. You know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> it would be great. Maria, right. I, I, I have a big question. Um, you know, since we've been talking about, uh, like, the earlier cultures and, you know, later cultures, uh, maybe in some instances, uh, the earlier cultures were um, more advanced. Um, let's uh get your view on the original builders of Stonehenge you know when did they do that and, uh, can you provide a description of the uh people and who came later what were the cultural changes absolutely i mean when we look to the very earliest people that occupied the area of stonehenge that we're looking at now we're looking at the outer lintel there and that single stone at the top is a greater trilithon it was the largest stone at stonehenge but when we look at the people that built it that were buried uh, in the what's called long barrows of the neolithic they had very long skulls and there seems to be in two Two types of long skulled people. You have the natural long skulled elongated people, and then you had a kind of hierarchy there that extended their skulls through cranial deformation. And so when you when you extend a skull with boards, you get two distinctive scars here down this part of the, uh, the face. And that's what was noticed by anthropologists. So I think the, uh, and it's for sure that uh, the ADNA proves this, ancient DNA, that the long-skulled people built Stonehenge and they were quite short. The femur bones show that they were no more than women four feet nine and the men five feet four. The much taller people came in what's called the Bronze Age, about 2,500 BC, and they were very tall. And, and they kind of changed Stonehenge and tried to make it theirs by changing stone settings and things, because it's always baffled archaeologists why has Stonehenge gone through so many changes? And they're coming around to my way of thinking because the, the beaker culture, as they're called, or the very tall uh, people, giants, as some people say, I think there were maybe a few, uh, but nonetheless, they came in after the long skulled people and started to change the stone settings at Stonehenge, making it theirs. And uh, so the, the original people that built Stonehenge uh, really did have long skulls. And I photographed them at Cambridge University. I've photographed them at Oxford University. And I've gone now to several different uh, museums and curators to look at these, uh, these different types of skulls. And I've been saying this, you know, since 2015, when I first discovered one of the long skulls. And we've got a very... You wouldn't have heard about her in America. She's quite a famous uh, archaeologist called Professor Alice Roberts. And she's now saying they were long skull people. Well, Alice Roberts, Maria said it first. <laughs> yeah, it's most people, well, most of the ladies will blame that the reason why the Stonehenge is all screwy and is because every man back then didn't ask for directions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not asking. I know I got this one, honey. I got this. Please <laughs> ask. Just ask for directions once. But um, yeah, the, there's the giant theories. There's, I mean, the long the long skull found all over, found all over. A lot of them in South yeah. America. Absolutely. Um, I mean, not the ones that look like tiramisu, you know, cakes that they showed recently. Um, you know, down down in Mexico, the Mexican mummies or whatever. Oh but, yeah. yeah, yeah. It it because it looks like someone went to like an Italian wedding and made just a tiramisu cake out of you know. Oh look, it looks like an alien, you know, type of thing. Um, now, do you do you think the elongated skulls, like that binding process to elongate the skulls? Do you think there's any um, possibility 
that that might have been a ritual type thing inside of the circle? Uh, well, we don't know where they uh, extended the, their skulls. It had been done as a child when the skull was very pliable before the sutures had become fixed because you see them in uh, in children. So we know that they had natural long skulls anyway, and then some of the elite were extending them, and that created a two-tier system. And that so what we've got here in uh, in ancient England, for example, is huge long skulls. I mean, they are very extended. But here's the thing. Even though they had very long skulls, their skull size to their body, when uh, you've got artists or designers of clothes, they say that the face is one eighth to the body size. And that's how you design clothes and things and artists draw. But to the uh, elongated skulled people, their skulls were one tenth. So they were much smaller, but long skulled to a body my size. So they would have looked out of proportion when you, you, when you uh, stack all of those measurements together from places like Oxford, like Cambridge, they would have looked a very strange culture. You'd have done a double take on them. And somebody uh, flashed up there. I, I, I briefly read that they had red hair in Paracas. Brian Forrester has uh, constantly uh, mentioned this. Some in the British Isles had uh, red hair and some had quite dark hair. And it's believed now that they had quite dark Mediterranean looking skin as well. And it was the much, much taller Bronze Age people, the Beaker culture, very tall people that had lighter skin and more blue eyes. And interestingly, in the ADNA, the ancient DNA, when these two cultures met around about Orthodox dating, 2500 BC, they didn't interact with each other for 500 years. That's the latest research. So why did you get these two cultures? They didn't interact for 500 years. And then, says Professor Ian Barnes, there was a tipping point, and then they started to intermarry. And then we get lose the ancient DNA of the long-skulled people. And there we have it, folks. Don't do that. Don't marry outside of this. <laughs> <laughs> Don't marry outside of this. Everybody's like worst nightmare. I can't believe you're marrying that giant. Um, <laughs> but I love him, Dad. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, well... Th this goes back to we were i think we talked a little bit about it book of enoch at one point i don't want to get too crazy but there's so much history that you have to you can't you can't like live life this way and like nope this is what the fossil record is nope i'm not no no well i looked it up i researched it i didn't find any instrument no look outside the box there's plenty of of people that are doing this research they're not being published directly you got to go search not necessarily on on the internet as proper it's on these bulletin boards is on these other groups telegram so so and so forth open your mind and and the possibilities will will come in and you'll be surprised that you'll start you know like well i was skeptical until this came in this came in this came in there's no connection and they're proving each other so but this is great fantastic book and Mm -hmm. information i mean you got to go out and get, the, get these books yeah. and, and we have to get into the differences between the long burrows and mounds well yeah let's touch on that before we wrap wrap it up for yeah absolutely the the oldest monuments in the british isles uh are called as i mentioned earlier neolithic and you have huge, huge long barrows. And for those that, you know, in the United States, and they don't know what a long barrow is, imagine a huge piece of earthen works. And they can be up to three, 390 feet long. Yeah, some of the longest ones. And some of them have inside inner chambers. And these inner chambers can be a megalithic or they could be of timber for example, depending on what's, what's around. And these are massive monuments. And you were mentioning earlier that they have acoustic 
properties. A lot of the long barrows had acoustic properties. So I'm going to take you to Scotland now, and we're going to go to Campster Long and Campster Round. That's the, the name of the barrows called locally. And you have one long barrow and one 100 metres away. Um, I know that you do Imperial still, and I don't know the Imperial to that. There's 100 uh, metres away. And if you had a drum session in Campster Long and you're in Campster Round, 100 metres away, the sound of the drum would come out of the ground sounding like thunder. And that has been found by the Reading University uh, duo that went around different ancient sites looking at acoustic properties. So we know that the, the twinned barrows within 100 metres can exchange acoustic properties as well, which is quite intriguing. So these ancient Neolithic uh, long barrows, for example, uh, there we go. That's a, that's a beautiful finished off uh, calm that we're, we're looking at. They're, they are absolutely incredible. And you can stay in these. And even today, you can go to some of these monuments and recreate acoustic sounds in them. And there's the doorway in that picture that people could see. That's right. That's the entrance that you would go through. Now, you're in uh, sensory deprivation in these uh, mounds and tombs as well. So you don't see much daylight unless you look out. And if you look the other way, uh, it's, it's very, very dark. And you can get recesses within certain long barrows that you, you can't see outside. So they do create this kind of sensory deprivation that can uh, change your, your consciousness. And they're often finished off in a kind of quartz or flint or chalk, creating these snake-like monuments. That They're monumental and they really do stand out on horizon lines in the, in the ancient landscape. They are absolutely stunning. I, don't I think know that's one of the biggest things, real quick, before oh, Brian, I'll just, um, before you there, that for me is whatever, whatever it is, whether it's they've seen something that came down from the sky or it was something that in the past, but every ancient culture has something to do with an obsession of snakes, serpents. Yeah. Mm. Everything is, like I said, it's whether it's the carvings of, you know, there's carvings, what, you know, Chinese and dragons. I mean, you have right here, these cultures. They built it. If you just look at this picture right here, it has an appearance of the tail going up to a head. They just, they have, you know, in the mounds, there's, there's that real famous one. Um, Mark might be able to help him or Serpent Brian. Mound. Serpent Serpent mound. Mound. It's, I'm, I can't remember well, the location. I'm not sure where that's lo People located. Ohio. Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that one clearly looks like, you know, looks like a snake. Oh, and absolutely. And and you've got to, yeah. Sorry. You've got an equivalent of a serpent mound in Oban in Scotland. But also, just to add to that, that's what you can see. According to the ancient Chinese feng shui masters, you had dragon lines in the earth. And these dragon lines were massive earth currents. And these were aligned on those currents as well. So these kind of monumental serpentine monuments were placed above serpentine earth currents that the ancient Chinese called green uh, dragon or the azure dragon and white tiger. And they were forces uh, that created energy coming out of the ground. They even today, uh, Chinese geomants and dowsers like myself look for those dragon lines in the ground. I, I mean, wow. I would welcome. I don't know if you've come to the northeast of the United States at all, but there it's pockmarked with these stone chambers. They're incredible. They're very mysterious. There's someone who's in the paranormal, and she's written books on it, and she's absolutely wrong. It is not Native Americans, you know, uh, food seller or root sellers at all. No. They are they are lined up astronomically. Mm. There are anomalies internally. There's sound anomalies. There's magnetic anomalies. They still don't know what it is. I mean, and some of them, I've been in a couple of them, and when you go in, it's 10 by 10, 10 feet by 10 feet by, you know, 9 feet tall. And when you look at the back, you know, stone that's there in the center, which looks like a door, 
look at it with the naked eye. There's nothing on it. But if you put a UV light on it or 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 infrared, you'll see runic writing on it. You'll see, you know, four characters, which earth, wind, fire, water. I mean, yes, the, the stone chambers uh, of New England, they were investigated by John Burke, for example, who wrote an iconic book, Seed of uh, Knowledge, Stone of Plenty. And he found if you put seeds into these stone chambers and then you replanted them, they go they would grow twice as strong and twice as fast. Now, I think that is correct, but I add into that uh mixture of knowledge that the earth energy there which is a spiral pattern it's when you place chambers over that spiral pattern the coil of the dragon to the ancient chinese that's what enhances seed growth so he placed seeds in all of those chambers in new england and you could have much better crop yield per acreage uh, with that but I just go that one step further and say they put it on the coil of the dragon uh, as they would do in ancient China and Dowsers would know from you know, way way back centuries before so I think these places were multifaceted they were spiritual they were practical they were taking you through different dimensions to a certain regard they're not just one thing they're a multifaceted diamond yeah. Well, yeah, this has been incredible. Yeah, um, no. Go ahead, Mark. I, okay. Uh, um, yeah. And I just wanted to read from this book, Aubrey Burles, um, The Stone Circles of the British Isles. Um, uh, Mr. Burl writes, uh, the probability is that they, the Beaker folk, had some share in the inspiration of them all. And the raising of these temples throughout Britain is further proof of the widespread religious conformity that this uh, people was able to impose. Physically very different from the slighter, gracile, Neolithic stock, these powerfully built foreigners first came mm -hmm. to the country at the beginning of the second millennium and settled around the mares and islets of eastern Britain before eventually moving inland and up the rivers, etc. Um, so, you know, in 1976, when he published this book, uh, he's basically saying the same thing you are. Uh, why are you... Um, you know, being uh, censored. Uh, it's, it's very strange, I suppose, because I just take it one stage further by uh, by increasing the height, uh, by saying that they're more long skulled. They've got very different ear placements. So, for example, if you read the, uh, the reports uh, from anthropologists, they describe a skull like this, but instead of having ears here, Mine's beneath my hair, obviously, then their ears were off place. And so they could have had a mythical, fairy like, pixie like appearance. And that would, they don't want these anomalies known. So I think I push the boundaries uh, a little bit more. And also, what I noticed about the elongated skulls, they were like the same size of a child's of about somebody about 12 years old. Now, put a 12-year-old skull on a, an adult body, and it becomes completely out of proportion. And that is, if you go to any of the anthropologist reports, that happens time and time again. Now, I sent one report to a wonderful doctor. She works in what we call a and &E. I don't, I can't remember what you call it in America. We call it accident and emergency. It's where if you have an accident, you go there. And I showed her these reports of the inner ear bone structure and said, you know, what, what do you make of this? And she said, that's, in, that's impossible. That's not how a human uh, inner ear is. And I said, but what if it was? What, what if it was when they would hear different frequencies? So what I think the perception of the ancient elongated people of the British Isles was, they could hear 
different frequencies and understand things a little bit differently. Their perception of a stone circle would have been more auditory. Yeah. And uh, with my experiments done on standing stones, looking at the frequencies coming out of standing stones with Rodney Hale, that used to work on the Dragon Project and David Webb. Uh, for instance, we got certain points on the stone that were 18 hertz being emitted by the stone and people here at 20. And I think the elongated skulled people could hear different frequencies coming out of the stones that we've measured. So maybe we look at standing stones, maybe they heard standing stones. Uh -huh. And then real quick, um, Emma Ellen was, um, as we wrap it up here, he wanted to know about um, the common thought of Stonehenge being geared around farming. What are your thoughts uh are on that? Yeah, I mean, the, the whole of the landscape was cleared, that is for sure, for trees, because snails, different types of snails, like different type of environment. So it was definitely cleared. But I think it was far, far more than uh, than just farming. Uh, it it can in, included, for example, very complex lunar alignments, far, far more than the sun. Now, I've written about them in The Secret History of Stonehenge, and lo, after I've had that, they announced yesterday that the major uh, alignments at Stonehenge were lunar. But before that, they were always talking about the summer solstice, for, for example. Aubrey Bell noticed as well that there was a lot of uh, lunar alignment. So it's an astronomical uh, temple uh, as well. This in a huge environment that contains Woodhenge. You've got a fantastic Woodhenge in Cahokia, uh, Illinois, if I've got the state right. And uh, it's, it was very similar to, to Woodhenge. Uh, over here, but ours was a bit more kind of more concentric circles on the inside. So Stonehenge is a massive environment that surrounds it, mile after mile, monument after monument. Awesome. Thank you. Nana. Okay. Well, Nana said, very wise, I enjoyed her knowledge tonight. Oh, yes. Well, couldn't, couldn't think of a better final guest. Either. That's so I said, that's that's one of the, that's part of the announcement here, folks. I said, just get you know, cluing it, people in there. Yeah, it's it's everybody need to go to the Avebury experience because we need to let this poor soul go to bed. <laughs> yes, yes, it's a. So I'm going to sh share up here. So everybody needs to go to the Avebury experience. Two thirty in the that's, morning here. Yep, the Avebury experience dot co dot uk. Thank you. And the Thank book we're talking about right here. Secret here, history of Stonehenge. Find out what the crown doesn't want you to know. Yeah, <laughs> Mark's, Mark's got there. Yeah, you can go to, you know, the cards Excellent. right there. You can purchase everything right from there. So if you've enjoyed this, you know, definitely, not only that book, we've been talking about the elongated skulls. She has a book on that. Um, just, you just go through and just divining. I mean, if you want to watch one of the last shows we did to, uh, with her, we talked a lot about dowsing and dowsing rods and stuff that she, you know, the experience she has with that. Mm. And there's Perfect. Mark's got the, yep, Mark's got that book as well. So, yes. Maria, Perfect. thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. I appreciate it's it. Great. Thank you uh, for be asking great questions and being the perfect hosts. Well, I appreciate, appreciate, appreciate that very much. You have a good morning, evening, good morning. <laughs> yes. Have a good morning. Enjoy, enjoy your Thursday morning. <laughs> and a lot of tea, Earl Grey tea in a few hours. Yeah, yeah. She'll, need that to, she'll need that when she wakes up, for sure. Yeah. I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Best, best of luck with the book thank there for you. Thank, thank you, Maria. You. Good night. Good night. Cheerio. Good night. Cheerio. All right, everybody. So, big announcement. So, next week is yeah. going to be yeah. the final episode of the Three Beards podcast. We life life has just life has just come come to the thing is just I'm working a ton as you can notice Chris Chris hasn't been able to make it on his his life is his life is just chaotic um we've 
I'm gonna still I'm gonna still do two shows with um, Joey, the Sinister Mysteries, um, and the Mighty Phoenix might arise from the ashes at some some point. It's just right now, right now it's it's it's, it's one of those yeah it's one of those things where you know the saying is always is go out go out on your terms go out you know go out what you'd consider on tight um on top and so like for right now it's just there's fam we got family medical stuff coming up and it's just personally like in truth i know it's i know it's shown i know it's shown on the show people have read it i'm not as prepared as i normally am I, I, I feel like I've mailed it in on several of the shows I, it's, it's, I, I just, I can't, I just, I, like I said, it's one of those things, um, the, it'll be into the outer realms. Um, Ert radio is going to be sponsoring as well. He's going to stick with, you know, with the sinister mysteries, he, um, he's doing that stuff and then we'll be showing, sharing that on there. Brian's going to share his stuff, you know, here, this thing. Yep. I got a, a new a new thing i'm gonna do and i'm going to yeah it's it's a it's a weird thing the third third eye live i i go third eye live. it's not f it's not fdi um, fda approved yet because something about taking the cadaver eyes and implanting it in your head right in the forehead it's it's an experimental process i mean let's just say i mean i i could think of a lot of things where i would have spent my time and energy on than just trying to figure out how to implant a third eye into your forehead but he's he's doing the live third eye yeah, we, we, I mean, come on, we, we all enjoy the paranormal. And I, you know, I research, I go out and investigate these things, but we can't always talk about paranormal. Um, we can talk about mysteries that they're pretty interesting. But when you know, use your third eye, you're talking about your consciousness. Um, and it allows you to, like, how does your that third eye operate in doing a podcast, doing, you know, playing music, writing music, painting, um, literature? speaking and it's it just gives you a different field of view and you know hopefully we'll do that and then um someone named craig will come back with a vengeance and just shave the this part of his mustache off and this half of the beard <laughs> and yeah. it'll be a kind of beard you know live yeah no as like i said it's not good like i said i'm still gonna be on uh, let's talk about facebook and it's like you'll still see me share it's like i'm yeah, gonna be bro. doing at least at least two with joey um yep as this kind of thing it's like i'm not going cold turkey it's just for me you know we it's just you it was one of those things it started with austin chris and me it, it was just and we 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 did this thing as, as the trio and then when austin fell off you know brian stepped in you know as you know amazingly is you know to help us out mark can't even that's one of the reasons why i wanted to have him on and, and hopefully he can make it here next week too for the Grandfather, yeah. we can just we can re reminisce about the the stuff, you know, just all the ones, you know, just all the fun stuff that we've gone through, all the stuff that we, you know, we've come through. So maybe we can even, if Austin's available, maybe we can even convince him to come back on, you know, to the to the thing too. Yeah, it's just it's just one of those things. It's like it's hard, but I can tell you, everybody, the more I think about it, the more I'm I'm at peace that this this is the right decision to do. Yeah, well, it's just, it's just, it's, it's kind of like, it's been, it's been fun. It really has. It's been, like I said, you guys have, you guys have really looked forward to talking to everybody and it's not, like I said, it's not good. It's not a long, it's not a long goodbye. It's not like, you know, I'll never see you guys again. It's just, it's one of those chat, chat will still be there. F jump in to, into the outer realms, watch the sinister mysteries with, you know, with stuff and I'll be on there chat with her. I'll share that when I'm on. Um, but it's one of those. Yeah, it's just, it's just, it was time. It was time, well, and it just. I'm I'm not Craig or Chris or Austin, or or Mark, so my vote really doesn't count. But um, I'm saying just take a hiatus. I've been pushing take a hiatus. Don't just. Yeah, he's know, he's so. he's been pushing to s stay the course, but I'm I'm just I. No, I mean, we we need. I mean, like everybody kind of needs a break. So you know, a lot of a lot of a lot of shows go they go dark in um in the the summer and people you know and people aren't listening to these shows in the summer um doing a lot of reruns or or whatever but um you know i don't think you should take 
I know you've been doing it a while and just, you know, throw it out the door. Um, never say never. And, you know, who knows? Maybe you just change the whole thing up and it's, it's, it's Craig and Joey back on three beards. You know, who knows? But I wouldn't throw, throw that away. Yes, it is hurricane season coming up in Florida. It's going to be a bad yeah. one. Too. So it's but, going to suck. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, I, I, I understand that you, know, you have to take uh, you know, uh, time off or uh, you know fa family situations. Um, you, know, you don't want to just do a show but put out crap. Um, yeah, you know, that yeah, that's where you know, you're kind of. You know, really letting your fans down that you know help to build a show up. Uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm glad to have you two on, um, or, or the whole you know beard uh, uh, co-hosts on you know, any of the sh you know sh shows I'm doing. Uh, but yeah, you know, yeah, you know, there are times when. You just have to uh, step away and you know take care of some things. Uh, you know, cut cut back for a little bit, but mm -hmm. you know, keep keep your foot in the door to. Uh, oh, it's not. We're not shutting this. Quality stuff to the show because you know I think in the three years or so that we, you know we've worked together, you know, I think we've uh, built up a really uh, informative, uh, entertaining, quirky. You know kind of show i yeah you know it, um yeah ron suggested that brian suggest you know it's like i said they've done it i said i think that that is definitely a possible possibility it's just it's like right now i've got to step away and just it's that's it, not a doubt that's why i'm saying you know and look yeah. i'm not here trying to convince you you're gonna do it's, this is your baby i i appreciated being asked on um and i'll always you know come back when you come back you want me? Yeah, I'm there. Yeah, um, because I have the cool rim shot. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but again, yeah, that's that's a good chance. It's a, it's so, a, yeah, that's a good chance. It's a long, it's long, but you know the format. It's like I, there is one thing. It's kind of like where I, I kind of dropped the hint. I'm really looking at um, not doing as many. If we do come, it would be not doing a lot of stuff where it's just constant, just interviews. To where it's going to be more just shows, you know, top, either talking about a topic or just going going back to kind of kind Dialogue. of thing. But it's just, yeah, well, it's just, that works because you you bring an interesting perspective, uh, an informed perspective. It's not just uh, yeah, just you know, like the, you know the sixth grade girl. Uh, slumber party as you know one one of the shows i listen to you know talks about is uh you don't say anything magnet. of importance it uh you do yeah that's you know in truth in truth to you know it's always just been kind of a little bit of a bummer for us too just how you do all this effort and it's just it has been a slow grind and it's just taken forever to build you know, but in August, it would have been six years. I mean, it's like I said, this isn't, we've given it the good old college try. It's, it, it's, we, we definitely, we've definitely had a lot, a lot it's of good more ones. than a try. You know, I would think maybe next weekend, since it may be the last show, uh, we would be having hookers and blow. Am I close? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, I can't, I can't even begin to think. Everyone's yeah, going to be wondering who left that baggie there. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's just, you know, it's probably the you know, same Oklahoma. person that leaked the Dobbs decision. We can't find them. <laughs> yeah. Laura, Laura, you know, it just it said, M.A. Allen King, you guys, you know, you guys have been, you know, they're all just, along. you're always here. You're always supportive. And we, you know, we can't, we can't think, you know, Jer Jeremy was, was in here too. I mean, it's just, it's there. I go, I just, I can't even begin to thank you guys enough for the support. I mean, it's just, it's one of those things. It's like, we're, this isn't the end. Like you said, you're not, this isn't the last thing you're going to ever see of us. I just, it's one of those, I just want to let everybody know 
next step week is the one it's like, it's going to go dark for a while. Right after next week. Yeah. And, and then, I mean, you're going to see like, I'll, I'll share like tomorrow I've got a sinister mystery show. And then two weeks, we've got another one. Those are going to come on, but I just wanted, especially since you guys are here, I just wanted to let you guys, you know, let you know, this is not. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be crying in the beers. Well, you know, and it's like, is that also, I, I can't tell you how much that I appreciate that because it's like, I know you guys welcomed us into your house, you know, in, in your you, lives too. Can I use guilt on you? Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, you appreciate them, but yet you're fucking them by not doing another show. <laughs> but I there know. You go. Thank you. I know. Good night, everybody. I'll, re yeah. I'll return on it to you. It's because I got to focus on family. No, no, no. I, I trust me. We've had this conversation off, off air uh, enough. And, uh, you know, it could, it could totally change. You yeah, know, there, really. there could be a moment where you're like, you know what? That's a great idea. We're going back on. And yep. something as a relief to, to doing something. But there is a niche. It's just getting it. You know, I get it. Six years is a long time. You know, um, you wonder how people like doing stupid pranks. You know, they just get a hundred million people to view them. And they just yeah. do more stupid shit. And then people that are actually trying to put in a good quality show. It's, you know, I don't know. It's, I don't know if it's date, if it's timing, if it's, you know, the look, the feel, I, I have no idea, but I, I understand. So, you know, yeah. But and I, um, I've shared right there the link. Um, that's yeah. It's, it's like I said, we're, we're still there. It's like, definitely go follow Joey, follow Brian. I said, these things are, we're still going to be putting out content. Um, yeah, it's, it's, well, that's the thing about me and Joey, especially the sensor mysteries. There's not really a driver's seat. We're both, we're both back and forth. It's, it's almost, it's almost like the banter back and forth live and where we're talking like tomorrow we're talking about, um, the explosive rise of Barack Obama, how, it, how he went from obscurity to, you know, the ultimate, ultimate power in the universe. That should be an interesting uh, show to watch. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're it's so and that's what I said we're gonna we that's what we're gonna talk about and you know so a lot of those ones yeah you can definitely go back and watch those things because this is episode thirty five of that one. Yeah, yeah, and that that's one of those. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely but like I tell everybody, don't worry. It's like it's not this isn't a forever goodbye. This is yep. just I've got to I've got to step aside. And while you're while you're 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 signing up and subbing for somebody, sub to this channel because this is where it's going to be third third eye live and anything and everything I do, even beyond the realm, anything I did with Bronx Hill Paranormal Society, everything's going to be on my YouTube from this point forward. I'm not promoting 15 YouTube channels um, that you know because having it, it's all over the place. I'm condensing it to me. And my channel, and just do it in subgroups. But um, I mean, it's going to be fun, you know. Yeah, it's Joey made him no. a better offer. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's we could definitely we could definitely promote it, promote it. And I said definitely follow follow yeah. Earth Radio, follow Brian's thing, follow yeah Barbara DeLong, so you can see as there's stuff going in. It, it's as I said, keep supporting everything keep supporting everybody. It's like I said, I'm going to still sh shape those things, but it's definitely, you know, and that's the thing. It's just, it's, it's the right time. It's like I said, we'll, we'll get, we'll get that there, but it's one of those. So everybody tune in next Wednesday. We're going to have a good time. It's going to be a party and, and, and make sure you keep your phones on. Cause Craig is buying somebody a brand new Ford Mustang. Before you go. <laughs> That is called a that is called a bogus promotion. Fake news. Fake news. <laughs> yeah, but like I said, well, I'll I'll be sharing I'll be sharing stuff to you. Like I said, well, this isn't going to go this isn't going to go completely dormant. It's just going to be it just be twice a month instead of four times. All by myself. That's right. But I'm everybody, thank you for watching. I really really Thanks appreciate so it. Hurt Radio. Proud sponsor, <laughs> Mark.
Nightlight, go support him, please. You know, they said they, they said doing God's work, keeping it from being dark. Nightlight, Nightlight, it's do, doing their job. Like I said, go third eye, you know, get on the waiting list. Maybe you'll be able to get that um, once they get the implant process approved. You'll be able to get yeah, that one in your forehead. I'm telling you, it's, it's going to be totally different because we're going to have, like we did with uh, Nana. We, we called her up. If we have somebody on a psychic or a tarot reader, we're going to be, you're going to be able to call in and, and we're going to say, no, you're going to be doing a couple of readings for people. Um, we want people to interact with it. You know, nice. I, I'm tired of these, you know, it's great to watch a good show and whatever, but it, it's also like you have questions. It's, it'd be nice that people can, you know, call in and um, want the new car. <laughs> yeah. Talk to Greg. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's just, I want to be able to talk about whatever we want to talk about, you know, and, so and get everyone on. Yeah. I I'm also looking into like, you know, don't be surprised if, if I drag Craig into one of our, my shows and, and while we're waiting for, you know, him to get the epiphany or the bug of his ass after everything is fine and done, you know, to come back and thank you, know, you everyone. Appreciate it. Thank yeah. you for all the support. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, now, is there a difference between whether you get the left or the right eye from the cadaver? Do you get a better feet? I have no do idea. You get a better third eye experience. I, you know what, I, I, I don't know that. I don't know that. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, yeah, maybe depending on you know the deceased donor, you know whatever dominant eye they were, you know it works out better. That's the better eye to get you know implanted. All kidding aside, definitely support him. So yeah, I mean, um, I do have a promo. I think I posted on uh, Facebook. I don't want to give you three minute promo but i do have that and um and it's on my youtube page if you want to see it so thank you uh, thank you ron really appreciate that and you know at oklahoma where nobody's getting tired of you know you people following no. us like i said please you can't get rid no, please no, no, no. keep what like i said entertainment just well, all we're doing is the bomb. i'm shifting it to yeah. thursdays now twice a month and then Whenever Brian, as I said, we're going to go here and, and I've already told him, share it to this too. Share it to Three Beards Pocket. You don't go. You were working on it. getting that done so that, um, you know, at least yeah. you'll get content and stuff. Um, yeah, this is not going, this is, we're not shutting this down. This is going to still be here. This is going to be, like I said, I've just, it's just one of those as a break. weekly. You need yep. a break. That's it. Yep. That's it. Take the break. That's what it is. Okay. He's going into drug rehab. All right. <laughs> As you can see, I'm a meth head. Uh, you can you can clearly see all the weight loss. He's, uh, he's on meth. <laughs> I mean, I'm just can we all relish in the fact that Mark Eddy was not electrocuted tonight? Okay, yes, he, he survived. Yeah, it's, I, 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 yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll find out a little bit more from Joey how he uh, weathered the storm, literally uh, tomorrow uh, night. Yes. Please. Yeah, everybody join. Like I said, I'll be sharing here, but everybody join over. And I said, what well, you know, come join the conversation there and learn. You know, you might learn a few things that you never knew about Barack Obama. That's like I said, we're just a, yeah, FYI, we're not dealing with the whole, um, you know, whether Michelle is 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 a woman or a man. We're not going to be. We're not going to devil. We're not going to be. We're not going to be really talking about the birther controversy that the Clinton campaign started we're not going to be talking we're not going to yeah, focus dick, on that yeah <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna it's going to be just to give you a teaser it's going to be how even in the beginning how he pulled chicago style politics to become you know become a state senator you know and just went and how you go from being a community organizer to you know in less than basically in less than 20 years you're the president of the united states he was groomed. And that's like I said, it's gonna be it's it's definitely gonna be a you know really interesting topic. And like I said, so we're not gonna there won't be really any of the you know there's not gonna be really any of the, the really outlandish you know conspiracy stuff, but it's gonna be basically talking about the true thing, you know, Bill Ayers, Bernadine Dor Weather Underground, all that. Yeah, it's it's gonna be pretty so tomorrow, tomorrow, yeah. So tomorrow, seven o'clock Eastern time, and then um, took him how long to president? Um, he was elected state senator in '96. 
Um, and then he went from being a state senator in 1996 to, to, and so in 12 years time, he was president of the United States, which is an incredible trajectory to go from being never holding political office to suddenly you're the state senator and president of the United States. Not if it's rigged. Yeah, well, that's what it's, it's so it's, it's definitely, it'll be, a, it'll be cool. So. There's a little teaser. So join in that and then look for when Third Eye goes live. When so is at 8 p.m.? Well, I, I'm going to go live he, in May. He's stealing our time slot. No, I'm holding the time slot. There you go. Good job. I, I appreciate that. To, to lose it. But um, I got into Facebook jail, so I think I'm not allowed to go live on Facebook until the 5th of May. So I'm Well, so what you do is you go live with us. Well, I'm going to try that, but um, yeah, we'll it should work. That. But all right, everybody, Mark, thank you so much for coming on. We will see you next week. Yes, sir. If as long as you can have it. So that way I'll talk to us. Austin can see it, but it definitely, um, like I said, I'm going to force Chris to be on it regardless. He needs to be. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, so yeah. thanks for the opportunity of co-hosting tonight. Oh, it's, well, you're not going any place, Mark. I'm, I'm nope. stealing you. <laughs> yes. Everybody's got to have a Mark Eddy. Yes. Like I said, but everybody raise a glass for, you know, for us. I said, we'll, we'll do next. We'll do, we'll do one next, next week. Like I said, we'll have, we'll have a good time. Let's just, let's talk about all the fun, all the things like I said that we've done and just, we'll have, we'll have a good, we'll have a good time. It's going to be a nice party. Can we have someone come on in and be the roast master and then just everybody roast us? Oh yeah, I, I don't, I don't care. If Mark wants to do that. If he wants to come up with the stuff, I mean, that's the thing. I can take it. I can take it. I mean, everybody was joking about my hands underneath the table tonight. I mean, that's just, I can take it. By the way, this episode is sponsored by Easy Glide. <laughs> yeah, Easy Glider. As Jaron brought up again, the thing from Chris Dildo Palace. Dildo Palace. <laughs> See, that's the kind of stuff we got to remember. We got to joke about this. Yeah, it's the long same thing. Mermaids, they're magical, mythical creatures. And I knew Chris hadn't done a damn thing when it came to research. I knew it was, I knew the train was coming off the tracks right then and there. <laughs> the only thing he knew was little mermaid from Disney. That was it. So yeah, well, blow up dolls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brian never is speaking. Well, yeah, we'll talk about it. Brian never released that. He promised to release blow up dolls. I on wanted the eclipse, to, I, and he I, never I, did it. I couldn't get enough blow up dolls to do it. So, um, you would, I was surprised that down in, in, um, Florida, um, blow up dolls are pretty expensive. I don't know if Oriental Trader has them, you know, you got to get just to the cheap knockoff ones. Well, I was going to put like weights at the bottom and, and I have the helium tanks and I was just going to just all release <laughs> once. Would, just to hear it on the, on the news report would have been hysterical. And yeah. somebody released 300. Sex dolls over. Oh this. yeah, that would have been on WFLA news right away. I probably would have been in handcuffs. Like, why'd you do it? Because you know what? You never miss an opportunity. Flying beavers. An opportunity. <laughs> That's your problem. Helium. Well, the thing is, I was going to write "Watch Three Beards" podcast on each one of them, so that one thing. Yeah, except one of them would deflate, land on somebody's windshield, cause a massive car pile up all on I-75, and then all they're going to find is the one that says, you know, Three Beards Podcast. I just think it would be fantastic. Just I mean, like so I guess that we'd go out like Seinfeld, all of us getting arrested? Probably. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Yep. In, in, in the show as bad as Seinfeld did? Yeah, that would be awesome. I don't know. It, it would, yeah. We're going to work on these things. That's right. I blame Brian. Blame Brian. I blame Brian, too. <laughs> no, like they said, so when I was born, they broke the mold right over my head. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like I said, it's, that's one of the things. Nobody's nobody's at fault. No, nobody's everybody. Fault. All right. We got to run. I got, I got junk to get out of the street for yard waste day. I got to haul, haul it out of the house. So, all right, everybody, have a great evening. We will see you on the next episode, which will be. So, I will save it for next week because Brian loves that sound so much. So, I won't. I'm going to save that one. But just in, just in honor of his thing, we're gonna we're gonna play the one that Brian created.
for this one. So everybody, oh my God. Yeah, have a great night. Have a great night. No, not not that one. This is. Oh. <laughs>